Hello everybody! Welcome to the Scientific, Scientific Knowledge, Knowledge Podcast. Podcast. For today's podcast, we will be referring to John Hosper's introduction to philosophical analysis. So I have a question, partner. Have you ever wondered why there are things that whenever we see them, they don't change? Now that you mentioned, I think at some point I did. Now, I'm curious why such things occur. So, as we open our eyes and observe the world, we see certain events that are constant, such as events that are called regularities. Hmm. Now that you've mentioned these regularities, I've got the gist of it already. Pero ano bang examples ng mga regularities na to? Alam mo, good thing na nakuha mo na. Pero wait lang ha, let me think about an example. Hmm, ito. An example of regularities are patterns in nature. They occur in different contexts, and they can also be modeled mathematically. These regularities, they include symmetries, trees, spirals, meanders, waves, foams, tessellations, cracks, and stripes. Alam mo ba na counting is also a regularity because the places of each number are constant and can be interchanged. Ito pa. Alam mo ba na according sa philosopher na si George Santayana, he called these regularities as the thin vein of order in the flux of experience. Ibig sabihin lang daw nito na regularities are often often associated with order as they happen the same way again and again. Pero, not all regularities are invariable or constant. Most of them have variations. E di ba, sure tayo na ang water nagbo-boil siya at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Pero daw, pag pumunta tayo sa isang mountain top, discover natin na yung boiling point ng water is less than 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Really? Ano mo ba? Bakit? Bakit? So, eto, na-discover nila na the, yung boiling point is not invariable as it changes when we go to a mountain top. Pero we consistently observe na malalaman natin na yung boiling point of water ay hindi dependent sa temperature, sa moisture ng air, or sa time ng day, pero sa pressure ng nagsusurround sa kanya na air. At itong example na to, makikita natin na genuine invariance out of constant observation of variations that take place. That's very interesting, no? So, among these regularities where they have variations, most of the time pala, genuine invariance or true constants where a type of event occurs, without exception, is what we seek for. So, in short, yung scientific enterprise could be associated with searching for genuine invariance in, in nature. So, why is it important to look for regularities more often than the irregularities occurring in the world? Kasi, di ba, as for me, parang mas consistent yung mga irregularities na nakikita ko. So, bakit kaya ganun? Okay. Kasi una, we're interested in knowing and predicting the future events that might or will happen. Yun know, na. Pangalawa, when we are able to predict these events, we can act in accordance with these predictions. At pangatlo, consequ- consequently, when we act in accordance or we act uniformly, we correspond with the laws of nature. Hmm. Pero mas gusto ko pa na mapalalim yung knowledge ko about this topic. So I guess, let us know further what laws of nature is all about. G? G! Okay? So, partner, with that being said, ito may isa pa akong tanong. Oh, sige, sige. Have you ever wondered what is the difference between the laws of nature and the laws we abide by? I have some ideas, pero hmm, hindi ako super maalam. Share mo naman yun sa amin. Ah, oh, sige. Palalimin natin ng konti yung discussion na to. So first, we should look at how these laws differ from the way they are imposed. The laws we abide by are usually issued by a head of state or were enacted by a legislative body. These laws, as we all know, they control the way we behave. They are standards in a society that must be followed. They also tell us what we should and shouldn't do. Pero kasama din dito ang mga possible consequences na pwede nating maharap kapag either sa dalawa ang ginawa natin. Then, based from what you said, this means that the laws we abide by are prescriptive? Yes, tama ka dyan, partner. Pero on the other hand, ang laws of nature ay naiiba dito. Instead of prescribing what we should and shouldn't do, 
it just describes how nature works. You cannot prescribe how planets orbit, diba? How they orbit the sun. Because their orbits are constant. We can only discover how the planets orbit the sun. Ibig sabihin lang nito, na yung laws of nature ay descriptive nga talaga. And as a conscious being, capable tayo na mag-prescribe. Pero, ang uniformities ng nature ay hindi kayang ma-describe ng human talaga. Sinasabi lang dito na, Laws of nature is not a prescription that we are obliged to follow, but a description of how nature works. Magbibigay ako ng isang example dyan. Sure. Yeah. Alam mo ba yung uh, planetary, law of planetary motion ni Johannes Kepler? Dito, describe niya lang how planets move in their own orbits. Yun lang yan. However, there is a lot of confusion under the law of nature kasi it requires us to be clear because it's a special class of empirical statements. And since it is a special class of empiricism, nire-require tayo nito na gumamit ng mga instruments para mas makapag-provide tayo ng statement kung paano nagiging posible yung laws of nature na to. And may reason kung bakit kailangan natin maging clear sa law nito. Kasi nga, as I have said before, isa siyang special class. At siya yung core ng empirical sciences, gaya ng physics, geology, biology, and etc. So, um, sa pagkakaintindi ko, we should know the difference of laws of nature from the laws which and the confusions between them. Then, what are these confusions? Para naman avoid ko siya at maging ng listeners natin. Buti na lang nakapag-research mo dyan. <laughs> so, ito ang mga confusions na kailangan natin ma-avoid. Una, laws should be, should be obeyed. Pero ang laws of nature ay descriptive. So, it's not an order that anyone has given, nor does it involves obeying or disobeying. Number two, where there's law, there's a lawmaker. It only applies to laws which were prescribed by someone. Law of nature only describes how nature works, hence being descriptive. At pangatlo naman, laws are discovered, not made. Ito yung statement naman ito ay applicable sa descriptive laws such as yung laws of nature. How the laws of nature works are identified by humans lang, pero humans do not make it. Looking for uniformities or what humans do instead. And law of nature include empirical statements in general, but it is not the type of observation that is simple in nature. And additionally, may considerations tayo kung paano nagiging law of nature ang isang statement. So, ano, tara? Alamin natin kung ano na yung mga statement na to para ma-differentiate natin yung law of nature from the laws that we abide by. So, what makes a statement a law of nature? So, meron tayong apat na statement para malaman yan. Una, a law of nature is a universal statement. If hindi siya 100% or kung 95% lang, statistical law ang tawag doon. Pangalawa, a law of nature must be open-ended. Number three, natural laws must be expressible as hypothetical statements. Number four, the greater the generality of a statement, the more likely it is accorded the stat to the status of a law of nature. So, laws enable us to predict, these kind of laws rather, enable us to predict future occurrences, although it can sometimes be called a theory. At mabibigay ako ulit ng example, sure. ang laws na na-formulate ni Newton. Uh, usually, laws often require corrections or qualifications and ang mga laws nito, pending pa rin sila for future discoveries. So, with that partner, after being informed of what laws of nature is all about, dumako naman tayo sa kung paano natin ito naiintindihan at ano ang ginagamit natin para, alam mo yun, mas mag natin yung idea na ito. So, without further ado, take it away, partner. Thank you, partner. So, from, a, from our previous talk, we've already encountered some important aspects of scientific knowledge. With this, na-consider mo na ba how scientific knowledge works? Hmm, oo nga, no? That makes sense. So, pwede bang explain sa akin at sa aming mga listeners, paano nga ba nag-work ang scientific knowledge? So, scientific knowledge, it allows us to explain, note that explain, why many things occur as they do. This means that we don't need much scientific knowledge to explain lots of particular events. Wait, so, does this make scientific knowledge irrelevant? Kasi sabi mo na, we don't need much scientific knowledge to explain lots of particular events. No, partner. Ganti yan. Scientific knowledge is relevant 
Kasi it talks about understanding that explanations aren't always answers to the questions why, but they can be merely requests for clarifications. When we give an explanation, we tell the entire how we do something or how a device works. The scientists are most concerned with explaining the why of events, but we can get further in explaining without introducing theories. For example, why does water, unlike most liquids, expand when it freezes? A chemist can explain the crystalline structure of water, of the water molecules rather. But this is a theory, not just an ordinary hypothesis. But in a more specialized sense, the entities involved in the explanation can be observed empirically. The water molecule in this example is a theory. It can be seen even with the most powerful microscopes. We can see the molecules but we infer its existence from the observable facts. Another example is that we can also observe the region of planets. But for a reason, this happened before there were, there were any humans to observe it. Thus, this can be counted as a theory. In scientific knowledge, it enables us to explain why many things occur as they do when someone does not know why something occurs. We explain it to them. Ooh, so, it means that an explanation can also be clarifications when we tell other explanation. We tell them how we perform what we do or how something works. Yes, because scientific because science, rather, is the most concerned with explaining the whys of events. However, we cannot explain an occurrence without theories. These theories are not observed by our senses, so we infer from what we empirically see. Ngayon naman, alamin natin kung ano nga ba yung connection ng explanation at ng mga theories. Kasi, a theory is never proof. Yes, it is always subject to revision in light of further investigations. That takes place. For example, if it rains, the street will be wet. The streets are wet, therefore it rains. So this given example is a type of fallacy which is affirming the consequent. Further, my question ako, paano lagi fallacy yung example na to? Because, from, based from the example, it doesn't mean that the street is wet, it rains. It can be that there's a sprinkler that activated and happened to wet the streets, or it can be that a water line pipe burst and wet the streets. But this is also prevalent in science. If the theory is true, certain observable consequences will occur. Certain observable consequences do occur, therefore, the theory is true. Hmm. So, can we say now that science is based on logical fallacy? Yes, but only if science provides logical certainty, which it does not. Theories can be confirmed by observable facts to a certain degree, but not proven entirely. You can never conclude theories based on the description of the observable facts. However, theories can provide explanation of observable facts. But it is important to understand that there, there are a lot of false explanations looming around. For example, if it rains while the sun is shining, we Filipinos usually attribute this to Tigbalangs marrying each other. That's why the phenomenon is happening. This explanation may be plausible if Tigbalangs exists. However, there are no evidences that this encanto exists, to which we can confirm that this theory is true. So we, render, so we render it slightly probable. Confirming a statement entails rendering it probable to some degree. Yet, a single observation isn't sufficient to disprove a scientific theory. Scientists hold on to these theories most especially if they're well confirmed. Laws and theories are often assumed to contain a ceteris paribus or other things being equal clause. If something turns out that's not equal, this may refute current predictions but leaves the theory untouched. Scientific theories are formed by tons of empirical observations and even more to tear them down. Scientific theories can be preserved amid seemingly strong evidence against them. This is because scientific theories were not formed in isolation but a series of interlocking, highly coherent sets of claims. If a fault is found on one claim, this can be attributed to another one in the set of claims. So one example of a theory is the law of conservation of matter, which states that the total amount of matter, matter in the universe will always be the same. However, because of the transformation of matter into energy, this law has been abandoned. On the one hand, the law of conservation of energy states that the total amount of energy in the universe remains constant. But because there are different kinds and amounts of energy, there can be a lot of hypotheses to arrive at the right principle in the end. So the difference between theories and science is that a theory is only an explanation, probable explanation, but science is proven by observable facts. 
for an operation to be performed is needed. So, in that case, ALO and theory are often related to each other because the two are assumed to have things in common or things in equal or ceteris paribus. If a situation makes it unequal, the law can be refuted but the theory is not affected. Yes, you got it right. Also, there are scientific theories that are built up by performing a lot of empirical observations and a lot more to tear them down. Facts can only confirm a theory to a certain degree, but it can never prove it. In order for a theory to be proven, it requires a lot of evidence. Moving on, let us explain the different theories we have in the field of scientific knowledge. So, ano ano kaya yung mga theories na to partner? So, for the first theory, we have theory in astronomy. Let us find out kung tungkol ba saan yung first theory na meron tayo. As we all know, diba, when we look up at the sky during night, we see moon, planets, and stars moving slowly from east to west, setting and then rising again hours later, but they're, no, but they're not visible when the sun is up. We see them going all around the earth, so what can be more evident to our senses? This has been evident throughout human history that whoever had thought differently was considered quite mad. The earth, our home, the place where we're standing on, or seems to be, the center of the universe and celestial bodies revolve around it. Under this theory, we have three subcategories that were introduced to give explanation on the motion of celestial bodies. So, unang subcategory. The theory of crystalline spheres. Ang history na ito, it went around when the ancient Greeks and Arabs noted the sun, the moon, and planets moved about among the stars. The stars, even though they are moving, haven't seen any apparent change in position in relation to one another. The pattern of their constellation remains the same. So, how is this explained? So, it's a partner. Imagine a crystalline sphere in fixed on its interior hollow surface where the sun, moon, and the five visible planets, which is Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Each planet has a sphere of its own. So considering that they have different movements. Meanwhile, the stars were all fixed on the interior of the outermost sphere. This theory of crystalline spheres seems only a bit detached from the obvious observed fact. So second subcategory naman tayo partner, ang theory of epicycles. So, according to Ptolemy, noong 127-151 Anno Domini, isa siyang Egyptian astronomer which found some oddity in the motion of the planets. According to him, Jupiter undergoes a retrograde motion where it moves slightly eastward among the stars from some time then temporarily turns back to move westward. So, why does this happen? Can you explain further? Sure! So, ito nga. Ptolemy believed that the circle was the only perfect curve and all the celestial bodies moved in circles. Pero, if you imagine them moving in epicycles along the big circles, it can be attributed to the apparent retrograde motion among the planets, like Jupiter. Note ha, that if thorough observation showed a subtle variation in the planetary motion occurred, this new motion can be explained by introducing another epicycle. There is no general theory that could predict that planets would move in epicycles. But once the theory is accepted, it is only possible to track the path of the planets throughout the years since the variation over a period of years was regular. Even their future location, even so, no one believes this theory. So, ito na, pangatlo na tayong subcategory. So, sa pangatlong subcategory na tayo ng crystalline spheres. So, Ang category nito is heliocentric theory ni Nicolas Copernicus noong 1543 to 1573. This theory states that the Earth, alongside the other planets, are moving around the Sun. All motions, including the retrograde motion, can be attributed to this. Since the Earth is closer to the Sun, it orbits faster than Jupiter. When it is rounding a bend in its orbit, the more distant planet will appear for a time to be going in the opposite direction. 
then this theory is the same as the Ptolemaic theory of epicycles. But Ptolemaic theory is much more difficult to manage. Since if a new motion occurs, a new epicycle is needed to be hypothesized. Mm. There was a certain observable consequence that the heliocentric theory has but not the Ptolemaic. This is that if the Ptolemaic theory, the variations were regular over the period of years, in the heliocentric theory naman, if the Earth were going around the Sun in an orbit, in June it will be 186 million miles distant from its position in December. Therefore, there would be parallax. So, what's a parallax? So, this explains the, the slight difference in the apparent position of the nearer stars in relation to more distant ones. This is, if you look nearby, if you look at a nearby tree rather, from one window, then to another window, the tree will seem to be in a different position in relation to the distant hills in the background. So, in spite of a careful microscopic observation, no parallax happened. Thus, this was put against Caper Copernicus. But Copernicus held on to his view and held that the stars must be so the, the stars must be so distant that such parallax could never be detected. But he had no evidence to support his claim. Pero, no 1838, Coperni yung mga claims ni, Copernic ni Copernicus was right when parallax was observed. No one had suspected that even a near star could be trillions of miles away. Sadly, namatay na si Copernicus noong 1543 nung naprove yung kanyang theory. At in relation to the heliocentric and epicycle theories, it is important to understand that when choosing between two theories, the one that is simple and explains what is required is the one chosen. The heliocentric theory was simpler in terms of its explanation compared to, compared to the Ptolemaic theory that is much more difficult to manage. Thus, the, fir the former was more accepted than the latter. And gets naman natin kung bakit mas tinanggap yung heliocentric theory ni Copernicus, di ba? True. Pero, wow. I've always been in awe of celestial bodies in space. When uh, I've been introduced to these theories, I've come to learn about and appreciate it more. Since tinatakal na rin naman natin ang theories, why don't we look upon the theory of geology of, or for additional knowledge? Sure, go ahead, Mare. So, for the theory in geology. Okay. So, a lot of questions in relation to geology are existing. How were fossils explained? What did these fossils do to come up with a theory of what happened to the dinosaurs dug up in different places on Earth? Why did dinosaurs disappear so quickly? What does this have to do in determining the age of rocks and the age of Earth? But a clue that helped paleontologists and geologists determine the age of the Earth was the thin layer of, layer of clay in a deep George gorge in Italy. Although this has nothing to do with the identification of Earth's age, there was a thin layer of clay in the strata of the rock, the boundary of Cretaceous period and Tertiary period. This narrowed down to how dinosaurs became extinct. Stains of Eridium were discovered from the same period. Pero wait, partner. How do we explain the Eridium dun sa layers ng rocks? Eh ba, yung element na to, it can only be acquired from volcanic eruptions, comets, and asteroids that hit the surface of the Earth? Well, this is only a theory because Eridium, yun nga, can only be emitted from explosions such as volcanic eruptions, which can't be observed now and prove how dinosaurs got extinct. However, these extinctions show the pattern every 26 million years. Astronomers believe that there were some extraterrestrial solar flares or supernovae, or there are double stars that are not visible in the telescopes but can be detectable because of their gravitational effect on other stars. So, what does this have to do with dinosaurs? It is said that beyond Pluto, there is a vast array of comets that is called the Oort cloud. About every 26 million years, through gravitational attraction, the comets from this cloud are drawn to the orbit of the Earth. The dust of the impacts obscures light from the sun and causes plants and creatures to die. This theory was repeatedly confirmed, however, there is a missing link of the sun's dark companion. It cannot be located. If the dark companion of the sun that affects its gravity is confirmed, then this theory about the cometary explosion can be much more confirmed. Teka Mara, di ba you've mentioned about the dark companion of the sun? Pero, yes. since it has not yet been found, so, my question then now, will that counter the cometary theory? Well, there might still be a gap, gap in the explanation, but 
if the sun's dark companion is never found, it can be said that it must be there. The theory of where region came from, and if this came from the Oort cloud, can still be accepted because it fits so well as an explanation. This controversy involves many hypotheses, or hypotheses are educated guesses as to what happened back then. Ooh, napaka interesting, Mare. It's interesting to know how the age of the Earth would, how the age of the Earth was discovered, ano? And through yes. a thin, uh, thin layer of crust, pa. Now. Since we're already talking about basically everything around us that emerged, why not also talk about theory and physics? Sure. Go. So, ito na nga. Physics is known to be the principal domain of scientific theory. Physics is a stamping ground of scientific theory. Physicists deal constantly not only with atoms, electrons, but even more minute entities, such as quarks and leptons, for which there is no claim that everyone could see them, even with greatly enhanced microscopic power. Hmm. But what if there is no direct evidence for them? Do physicists believe that they exist? What is the evidence for them then? When scientists usually cannot explain the things they observe by the things they also observe, they attempt to explain the observed by means of the unobserved or the unobservable. O, di ba? Nakakahilo. Nakakalo. Yeah, Saan, nakakahilo yung word play. Yeah. <laughs> Ayun. So, they use this process in dealing with the issue called the ultimate constituents of matter. Of matter. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, in the primitive atomic theory provided by Democritus, it states that atoms are indivisible. So, alam naman natin that it means that these atoms, if divided into smaller pieces, of, in, divided into smaller pieces, we can uh, find the protons, neutrons, and electrons, and the other original element no longer exists. Just like in chalk, if you cut it in half and rub it in your fingers, they'll be white. This doesn't mean that there are no longer particles that exist, but rather, the small flaky particles are turned into much smaller particles that cannot be split. These are then called the atoms. So, kahit pala split mo yung chalk, Chalk pa rin siya, um, kasi mayroon pa rin siya ng malilit na particles. Tama. Hmm. Since there are, obser- there are unobservable entities in physics, how can physicists believe that they exist when there is no direct evidence for them? Hmm. So, ito daw. Physics has observed a multitude of unobservable entities, such as particles, waves, energy, and fields of force that ushered a new conception of reality that were never thought of a century ago. Theory in physics is the attempt to explain things through the unobserved. So, ito, mas palalimin natin ng konti yung discussion natin sa physics. So, una, science has revealed a world of unobservable entities and invisible forces, waves, cells, particles, and all interlocking, uh, organized, and structured down to a deeper level than anything we have been able to penetrate. In short, Science has provided profound discoveries that were never thought possible centuries ago but are considerably essential in the world we live in today. Mm-hmm. Pangalawa naman, not everything can be explained. There is a, what we call a brute fact, which means that that's the way reality is and we can't say why it is that way. Explaining something is, put it, is putting it into a wider context of, some, of something else. Kagaya ng paggamit ng pag-explain through laws or theories. And that something else is either explained in turn or remains unexplained. The ultimate laws of universe cannot be explained. At parami din nagsasabi na there is a reality of a different order which sustains that the world, which sustains that world and presents it to our senses. Most physicists naman are concerned with the composition of materials until the ultimate constituents, such as their inference, electrons, but physicists know that they exist. Moreover, Einstein hopes that a general theory would be made to cover all physics, although in lang, there is no such theory found yet that would be accepted to explain the unexplained of physics. O ba? Explain the unexplained. Nakakaloka talaga siya. <laughs> Kanina pa may observe and unobserved. So, yes. ayun. Eh, so, partner, speaking of explaining the observed by the unobserved, I have always wondered what was the concept of human emergence or emergence in general. I have learned a lot about the theory of physics. Yes, pero parang impossible kasi na, oo, oh, oh, nag-exist na tayong humans. 
Pero parang imposible nga siya dahil present ang mga inorganic matters. Okay. So, to give a response for what you're wondering, bago natin pag-usapan yung concept ng human emergence, let's first talk about emergence in general. So, emergence is the inability to predict qualities of things even if we have a complete knowledge of what occurred before. Because these qualities are emergent at a higher level. So, emergence, it only occurs when reductionism fails. So, now, baka malito kayo. We'll first talk about reductionism para ma-explain okay, yung emergence. So, reduction, yes. Reduction is often related to general atomism. Meaning that there is a basic unit that can generate objects or other things. To give an example, suppose that you have a Lego. That will be called the basic mm -hmm. atom. If we combine all the other parts of Lego that we have, buildings or other objects can be formed. Now, in this sense, if we can generate from the basic atoms or components such as the Lego to the formed objects such as the buildings, vice versa, then it is when emergence occurs. Oh, okay, okay. Pero, ito, question na lang. How can human emergence sure. be explained from this? Okay. Before we go to how humans emerge, let me first introduce the two kinds of emergence. Mm -hmm. So the first one is the epistemological emergence. So this occurs when it is not possible to predict in advance the emergent phenomena. This emergent, this emergence only occurs when the gener generative atomism fails, lack of knowledge and predictions that are too complex. Example, when a car is stuck in a rock fest parking lot due to a lot of interactions, with other cars that are also trying to get out or trying to get a space, it is impossible to know when the driver will get to the exit. This example shows that knowledge of that future event cannot be reduced to prediction from a small set of basic principles. Mm. So next, the ontological emergence. This emergence concerns features of the world that are not reducible to arrangements of fundamental entities. This emergence are rare and only exists in physics and chemistry. So now, let me explain human emergence. So, human emergence is under ontological emergence. So, it is said that the universe is composed of inorganic matter, including us, humans. However, here on Earth, humans reproduce, grow, and die. Nothing inorganic does these things, right? Um. So, it is said that living things achieve a level of complexity where something happens. We are conscious. Humans, the same way as chemistry combinations, even if there's a certain connection that occurred between the consciousness and its surroundings that we know of, predicting the occurrence of living, self-replicating beings will be difficult because human beings emerge at a higher level. Life is on a different level. In this example, the quality of emergence where humans are autonomous beings yet their existing is dependent and reducible on original entities which is inorganic matter. Okay, another question na naman. How can we identify if an entity is emergent or not? So we have four features of an emergent entity. So the following are, first, it arises from original entities. Second, it is novel. Third, it is autonomous. And fourth, it involves some element of holism. So holism, it means to take a look at an idea as a whole and not by parts that combines the idea. Mm, okay, okay. But I'll just add that in order to further understand emergence dito, Meron akong two examples of what can be considered as an emergent entity based on what you have discussed and kung ano yung naiintindihan ko. Sure. So first ay ang entanglement of quantum states. This special feature entails that when two objects are combined, the states of original objects do not fix the states of the joint objects and those original states do not continue to exist as components of joint state. Entanglement is different from generative identity as it prevents reduction of the state of the joint state to the individual state. Medyo nakakalito lang siya pero yun yung ibig ng sabihin. So next naman ay yung covalent bonding in chemistry. For instance, when two hydrogen atoms combine, they share one electron. And when the electron is shared, yung identity ng isa ay mawawala. And then the combined atom will possess only one charge. Tama ba ako dito? Okay. So, yung sa entanglement of quantum states, it just states that when two objects are formed, yung states ng original objects, kung saan sila nang galing, ay hindi makaka-apekto sa states ng joint objects. Tama. While dun sa covalent bonding in chemistry, yung um, 
characteristics ng isa or rather the identity of the one object ay mawawala tapos magkakombine sila ng two objects yes. like yung sa ano hydrogen atom so yeah, yeah that's right thank you Overall, sa pagka-clarify dyan Mara yeah. <laughs> thank you <laughs> medyo nakakalito lang talaga pero mm. Overall, the emergence uses scientific knowledge to arrive at a conclusion. And it is an example of naturalistic metaphysics. So, on the other hand, after natin malaman kung ano ang emergence, let us move on sa reductionism. G na ba ulit, Mare? G. Okay. So, reductionism is an approach to understanding the nature of complex things by reducing them to the interactions to the interactions rather of their parts for the simple or more fundamental things. So, kabalik talang siya ng emergence. It can also be described as the philosophical position that a complex system is nothing but the sum of its parts. An account of it can be reduced to accounts of individual constituents. Reducibility is a belief that everything that exists is made from a smaller number of basic substances that behave in regular ways. In some respect, it is comparable to atomism. Pero let me discuss. So, dumako tayo sa idea of reductionism na discuss ko sa part ng discussion na to. So, ito ay introduce ni Rene Descartes sa part 5 ng kanyang book, which is entitled Discourse on Methods no 1637. According to him, the world was like a machine. Its pieces, like clockwork mechanisms and that the machine could be understood by taking its pieces apart, studying them, and then putting them back together. A reductionist thinking and methods is the basis for many well-developed areas of modern sciences. So, under sir, reductionism, meron tayong tatlong categories. Ang una dyan is ang ontological reductionism. Dito, sinasabi lang na it limits a being into a single substance. For example, ang um, pinag-combine na NACL na makakaform ng table salt. So, next category is methodological reductionism. It states here naman na uh, we reduce a problem to its simplest components in order to solve it. Parang yung mga math problems lang. Lagi tayong tuturuan na i-categorize yung mga parts ng sentence para mas madali natin maintindihan kung paano natin siya masasolve. And so, pangatlo, naman na category, we have epistemological reductionism or theory reductionism. Ang theory naman ito, sinasabi na it has a complex system na pwede naman ma-explain if we reduce it into its fundamental parts. Uh, sinasabi rin na asserting something may be reduced to a smaller set of elements without sacrificing knowledge or yung comprehension natin sa isang bagay. And it also holds that all phenomena can be completely understood in terms of behaviors of microphysical entities or huwag mas pinaliit nga natin yung problem na yun. So, with that, no? Reducibility is a level of, re of reality wherein you cannot deduce a proposition on living things of how it can be possible that we are formed from inorganic matter, but we can grow and reproduce. A gap between the, rea the reality of organic and inorganic matter is present due to the argument that it, is, it really seems impossible. So, ayun, with that, Emergence and reducibility can be a complex explanation of the origin of entities. A person could know everything that there is to be known when it comes to physics or inorganic chemistry and still not have any idea of how it combines to form living things and cannot deduce any propositions of how. It seems unexplainable, unlike in biology, where we can explain terms and the functions. On the other hand, in physics and astronomy, we never, have, we never have to resort to this. Consequently, we have another explanation kung paano, saan, o ano nga bang mga nangyayari or mangyayari para magkaroon ng living organisms o life dito sa mundo natin. Okay, so medyo complex yung pagkaka-discuss no emergence and reducibility, but always understand that emergence occur when reductionism fails. Yes. So, as we all know, biology is the study of life. Many scientists are conducting research and studies as to how life began on Earth, and eventually they came up with an explanation. The start of life is from a single celled organism called cyanobacteria. From this, it developed into us today, being able to do so many things. So, a certain organ in the human body provides an explanation on why it is in our body and what, and what its functions are. The theory in biology does not only answer or accept the answer or purpose of a body part. 
explanation in terms of purpose is no longer accepted in biology. There is an evolutionary explanation when it comes to how a creature is created. So Darwin's survival of the fittest, where it is explained how a human being struggles to continue to exist, a creature is imbued with a purpose and does certain things to achieve their purpose. So, wait lang. What do you mean by purpose dito sa biology? So, sa context ng biology, the word purpose means a plausible and universally accepted explanation of why people do what they do in a sense that they reflect their purpose to the humans or mm -hmm. purpose when it comes to what is its function. This is where evolutionary biology hops in to yield an explanation. So, did human beings come from inorganic matter? Evolution from inorganic substances is already a sufficient explanation. However, there is an ongoing debate with divine creation of life. In mm -hmm. So, yeah. Nga. In connection with this, let us discuss kung ano nga ba ang dalawang pinagdedebatehan na matagal na rin usap-usapan sa mundo tungkol sa pagkakaroon ng buhay. These are the creationists and evolutionists. So, dito naman sa part ng discussion na to, creation versus evolution, alam naman natin na there is an interplay, di ba, between the creation and the evolution and biology of how things in the world are created. So, according sa mga creationists, for the creation, they say that the human being was created by divine creation. The debate here is that creationists do not believe that a life can be formed from non-life. It is not their fault now that God created life in his mysterious ways that the scientific method cannot verify. Divine creation is not discussed in sciences because it cannot be tested scientifically. They can uh, also show the drama of life and the evolutionists. The evolutionists, rather, still won't believe that there is God. Hmm, very controversial ng discussion na to. Well, sinasabi naman ng mga evolutionists na, For evolution, the argument here is that there is a theory of evolution with how microorganisms from billions of years ago gradually evolved to form life. God created living things and planted evidence on the rock. Biologists have detailed ways of how the process started. Then, they said that, to the creationists, they should start from step one and not jump to step 100 without understanding the process. You will really not get how it happened. The drama doubt that creationists are saying is the billion years of struggle for human existence wherein organisms are surviving by killing and eating each other. Grabe, sobrang sure. controversial ng usapan na to. At alam natin na isa pa rin siyang debate na hanggang ngayon ay usap-usapan at both ay merong pinaglalaban talaga. Yes, so, pinaglalaban. Tama, buti pa. Buti pa yung debate na to. Charot lang. Pero ito, bago natin ma-end ang discussion, kami naman ng partner ko ay may tanong sa inyo. Kung kayo ang tatanungin, guys, are you on the side of the creationist or on the side of the evolutionist? Let us know naman sa magiging discussion ng refresher natin next week. Yes. Okay. So, to conclude this discussion, now, to sum it up, scientific knowledge requires a lot of evidence to prove it because not all explanations are observable. Some evidences can't be acquired empirically, so it requires many years of study to finally gather sufficient evidence to prove a theory. Most of the explanations in scientific theory are based on theories and laws that are accepted, however, still lack proof. In some cases, it is most difficult to disprove a theory well established. A mere observation to disprove a theory will only be attributed to one of the many pieces of evidence which supports the theory, not disproving the theory as a whole. Because of the proposed most probable explanations, we still continue to discover and apply this knowledge in our daily lives. Wow, grabe. Napakahaba talaga ng yeah. topic na to. Dahil ang daming kailangan ng explanation. And science really has a lot of un unexplained um, tawag dito, they really have a lot of unexplained um, na mga pangyayari sa atin. And yeah. nakikita naman natin ngayon kung paano talaga ginagawa ng mga tao sa siyensa. Sa siyensa? Yes. Diba? Sa siyensa? <laughs> Basta yun, Mari. Na, kung, nakikita natin kung paano talaga nila um, pinag-aaralan ito ng mabuti. Diba? This is uh, This has been Sheila's partner. I'm Drea Narkia and this is my partner, Sheila Marie Garcia. 
And, and thank, thank you for listening to our <laughs> Scientific Knowledge Podcast. podcast. Bye, guys. Bye.